Hello, welcome everybody to the virtual editions of the Other Art Fair Sydney. My name is Luke Popkin. I'm the fair director for the Other Art Fair here in Australia. Um, you're joining me off the back of a very busy four days at the Cutaway in Sydney. We've just had our in-person events. And this is a, is a new chapter for us with our virtual edition. Um, this is a really great opportunity for us to harness everything about the other art fair that we love, uh, but in the virtual space. So a chance for those who were unable to attend, uh, or even for those who were able to attend, but maybe there's an artist or an artwork that they just can't quite get free from their mind, uh, to come and enjoy and explore and discover all the great talent we have, uh, have here in Sydney. Um, so we're here now in the cutaway. This is our fantastic home for the other art fair in Sydney. We're in the entrance here of our virtual space, as you can see. Uh, and what we have this week are three different rooms. They're all available from today for you to go in and explore. And each room has a collection of over 30 artists for you to, um, to go and see, to meet, to interact with, and, uh, and to find art that you love. Um, so tours will be taking place throughout this week, both hosted by me and also our curatorial team at Saatchi Art. So do keep your eyes and ears peeled for that later to come this week. Um, but for now, we're gonna enter into room one uh, and we're gonna meet a few of the artists that lurk inside uh, and we're gonna hear what they have to say. So before we go and meet them, I just wanna give you a bit of a sense of how to make your way around this space. Um, here we are in room one and as you can see, there are booths on either side. You can make your way through and see what it has in store. There's a few surprises along the way. We have Saatchi Art have created some fantastic collections with artists from around the room. Um, and as you can see, they are up here on the right. Eva Kremers has also created a really cool, funky feature where you can go and create your own happy cat character. Um, so do go and find that and, and uh, have a play around with that. It's a lot of fun. Um, and when you come to an artist booth, you can see their work first and foremost and take it all in and enjoy that. Our Meet the Others videos are on the side of their stand. Uh, you can click that and uh, see, what, see what they're all about. But you can also click to arrange an appointment with them online. So the let, Let's Chat function down here on the left, um, you can schedule appointments with our artists uh, and meet them online. But if you don't have time for that, then there also, there's also the guest book function. So the envelope icon you have there, you can click, you can send your questions across, ask them about a specific piece, uh, about other work that they have come down the line, uh, anything you may want, you can leave them your details and they can come back to you in their own time. So what we can also do, that's your way of working your way around and um, exploring at your own free will, but you can also come with a very specific artist you have in mind. So to do that, you'd click on the right hand side of the screen and anyone who's in this room will be listed in this list here. And if you click on their stand or their name, I should say, you can go directly to their stand. So that's what I'm going to do now, because I know exactly who I want to go and see. And that is Nicole Law. So I'm going to ask Nicole to meet me at her stand and she's going to join us now and tell, her, tell us all about her latest collection. And there she is. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Luke, and hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. It is our pleasure. So um, if people know you, Nicole, and know you as an artist, they may be a little bit surprised by this particular Indeed. body of work, I think it's fair to say. So uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about how this all got started and, and why, I guess, it differs so much from, from what we've seen from you in the yeah. past? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, well, yeah, for people who have seen me in the past, they'll know that pretty much for the last five or six years, I've been drawing in exclusively black and white, and that's it. And that started um, when my kid was little, and I had to put parameters around my work. You know, I had 10 minutes at a time, and it was like I didn't want to make any decisions. So it's like I only draw in black and white, and I only do repetitive stuff, so I can pick it up for 10 minutes and put it down. Now they're a little bit bigger and I can explore a bit more. So, um, yeah, I did love the black and white and I was by no means bored of it. But um, I just felt that after last year, especially after the bushfires, um, I live in the Blue Mountains and we got quite affected by it up here. Uh, yeah, and after COVID, I just 
I couldn't do black and white anymore. I just, I needed energy. I needed optimism. I needed joy. And this is what's happened. So, and as I said in my video, no one could be more surprised than me. You know, I, um, uh, I've started putting gold on everything. I've started putting glitter on everything. And it's all a bit fabulous, darling. It's so, it's so <laughs> fabulous. Let's get in a bit closer to some of these works because I think this is where we want to obviously get some of this detailing because we're not just talking bold pops of colour, we are talking glitter, we are talking metallics. We can see as we get closer here, those sparkles start to come through in some of these elements. Um, and uh, yeah, there's very little black and white in sight now, that's for sure. It's very right. and bold in your use of colour. Yeah, I, I actually am, um, I don't know where it's come from. I said to several people over the weekend, it's just come out of me in this way and I'm surprised at the confident lines and it, it just yeah it exploded out in a way I'm very excited by it um I've got lots more in me I know I've got plans for birds and sea creatures and all kinds of things after the the native flowers run out so watch this space and so because you mentioned the, the bushfires there so obviously you know as I'm sure people you know watching this from around the world would have heard uh you know our year not only did we um spend the year contending you know contesting with with the plight of covid but the the year started with you know some serious devastation so um mm. that you know not only did that mean you saw that optimism is that why you chose to to you know to focus on the australian native plants and flora uh partially yeah because um Many Australian native plants only germinate as a result of bushfire. So it is a symbol of resilience. It's a symbol of rebirth and, um, and that we'll, we'll get past any hurdles that are thrown at us. Um, it also, like I've always been fascinated with Australian wildflowers. Um, I, I think I've kind of done a bit of work on this and I think it comes from when I was nine years old, my family went around Australia for six months and um, my sister and I, collected um, wildflowers and pressed them for our brownie collector badges. And um, I think ever since then, I've been quietly obsessed with them. And I love Australian wildflowers because they're not, well, most of them aren't pretty. They're scratchy and they're textural and they're weird shapes, but they're, they're amazing. So that's where the interest comes from. And uh, you've been giving me a bit of an education as well this week in- uh, <laughs> I've been trying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's still trying to get up to speed on, on, and it's something that is something that we really cherish here, the, the fact that we have our very own collection of, of um, plants and wildlife here in Australia for us to celebrate that no one else gets to enjoy. So it's good that you've brought this here for people to, to get started. Right. I'm happy to yeah. educate. <laughs> so do you want to talk us through any of these particular pieces and... Um, you know which one which one well which one have you found because now we've had the live event um mm. you've had a chance to put this in front of people and, and get a sense of their reaction so is there anything yeah. you found people have been particularly drawn to i mean we can certainly see a few a few red dots yeah. already on this particular uh, uh collection yeah. uh, so if clearly had, some people already snapped them up yeah i had a few nice sales um I've got to say people were very interested in the Sturts Desert Peas, which you can see in the middle of the main panel there and also on the right. Um, you know, these are out of scale, real Sturts Desert Peas. They're in the desert. They're, you know, maybe five centimetres high. They grow on a, gr a vine along the ground. Um, and not everyone has seen them. So uh, it was really interesting. I would say at least half of what I sold was the Sturtz Desert Peas. So people are interested in them, yeah. Um, and if you haven't seen them before, they're this vibrant red and they look amazing against the kind of orangey peachy sand of the desert and the dusty green leaves. But they have this um, center in them, which is highly reflective. So it was just screaming out for glitter, don't you think? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. It's actually made me want to see them in person even more now. So that's the thing. It's, it, but and I love yeah, the fact that still, the fact that they are desert flowers. It still talks about that rebirth, that you know, coming out of the the darkness with something bright and vivacious, and um, right. yeah, yeah. bring a bit of joy into people's into people's darkness, yeah. um, which is what the one, on the, um, the one on the right there too. Sorry, the flannel flowers with the pink on it. 
next to the on the left of the Sturz Desert P. Um, they're actually called Phoenix flannels. So um, in the Blue Mountains recently, just the last two or three months, there's been these explosions of pink flannel flowers, which are traditionally or well, usually like this very gentle white green colour. Um, but the pink ones only flower after fire. So, you know, half of Sydney's been up here looking for them, but that's, that one was definitely inspired by those Phoenix flannels. And do you think you will, you'll ever return to the black and white or is this now you, you're, you're just enjoying these expressions of colour uh, or with colour? So it, It's possible. It's possible. Um, you know, never say never. I just, I feel like I've got a lot of this in me though that's waiting to get out. So it may be a little while till I return to the black and white. Well, it works so well. I think, you know, that, that's what's so interesting when you get to follow uh, specific artists, you know, yourself included, that you take these twists and turns on your, you know, during the course of your career and you get to mm. see moments that are taking you in completely new directions. And um, it's something we'll hear from, from another artist later a little bit about, I believe. So, um, so great. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us. I should say to everyone you, that um, if you've got specific questions, we're going to invite Nicole back at the end. So do, do let us know any specific questions you've got. Um, and we're going to go from the kind of curious shapes and, and um, crazy lines of the Australian native plant to the urban environment now. Uh, and the sort of geom geometry and straight lines of John Setter's work. So we're going to head to John and we're going to see what he's got to tell us about the, the urban environment in his amazing photographer, photography. Yeah. Welcome. Hello, how are you? How, how are we doing? Yeah, yeah good. So, Thanks um, for joining us. So I think we're, um, everyone's probably looking at these and going, well, they are obviously vibrant and they're interesting shapes, but but where have you found these pieces of the urban landscape to photograph? What, what, how do you find, do you want to, well, tell us a bit about it first of all, and we'll, we'll then get into some of the detail about where you find the inspiration for your work. Uh, I guess the first thing I usually get asked at any fair seems to be that, are they paintings? Because in print form, a lot of people are perceive them as paintings because they're very vibrant. And they don't really look that architectural until you get really close. So that's kind of the point. So it's all about shifting people's perceptions within every day. So uh, the way I go about finding these is just a lot of walking. Like <laughs> I walk around urban environments for all day, whenever I actually make a day to go shooting. And the reason they're so vibrant is because I shoot in the middle of the day, hard sunlight unlike how it's been in Australia last week. But uh, yes, yeah. And then a lot of these images come from various locations around Australia, America, and a few other places, just because it's wherever I end up traveling to, which has also been very difficult the last couple of years. Yeah, no, indeed. I mean, so the, a lot of these, these images would have, would have come from your travels in 2019, is that right? Uh, yeah, around probably the last, two or three years because like even this a small body of work to get a few images I like will take it takes a year or two to create just because it's no matter if I shoot a ton of images I only really end up liking maybe like yeah, 20 to 30 so it's just yeah it's all about then having a big collection editing it down and do you do, what, what, in the images you take do you find the specific you know finished pieces or is it something where actually you will you would shoot, uh, you know, for days at a time, and then you'll find the finished pieces within the images you've got. Where, at what point do you get to the finished article? Is it on the day uh, itself? So the compositions are all shot in camera from what I see. I meticulously will move around and try to line everything up in camera, usually having to sometimes attempt that like 20, 30 times to make sure I get it right, zooming in on the camera and the LCD screen to make sure everything's lining up. And then I overexpose the sensor in the hard sun, so it creates a more vibrant pop. And then it's just, yeah, it's just a matter of like seeing these details in person, I guess. And then, and then post-production, I try not to do very little, especially like cropping, because then that affects the print quality. And then if there's a bit of dirt, I'll clean it up a bit. But like, 
I try not to do anything as possible. And then for print, there's certain things you got to do to get it ready for print, but that doesn't really affect like the actual composition or anything. It's just trying to sharpen and kind of flatten some other things out. So you so you like it to be as true a representation of of the you know the environment you've discovered, um, yeah, as definitely. possible. Yeah, and I think it's just obviously great that you sort of draw out the beauty in our, our you know the architect architectural forms. Um, so does each have a have carry much meaning to you in terms of in the moment and, and the place that you visited, or is it more that you you know you talk about sort of change in perception? So for you, is uh, it? creating something new or it reflects the moment you're in and the experience you had shooting it? I guess kind of both because when I got into this, it was because I moved to Australia and I used architecture as my way of kind of making sense of this new landscape. Mm. And I kind of carried over to wherever else I was traveling. And then someone then I eventually picked up a camera and has now evolved into this. But uh, yeah, so I just kind of shoot and try to use that to find materials and textures and colors that kind of feel like that space and then translate them in a way that maybe will people resonate with. I don't know if they don't, but at least I know I do, but it's just all an attempt. Absolutely, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, they, they do take on this whole new um, new context when you display them in this way. So, you, do, you know, it's, 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 it's great. And the, these are all available, And but also if people, um want to get the full collection that you've got a book published am i right yeah yeah i have a book you can see it's sort of behind me um yes yeah, so there's about 70 plates in there and that's again over about four years worth of work because i did my master's at a school and then after that i published a collection that was like broader collection and um yeah my, all these are in this in the book and there's many more of course but these are just some of my more particular favorites I thought of display for the virtual fair. And so it must have been your 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 creative process must have been hampered somewhat by <laughs> events of of 2020. Um, is that is that kind of forced you to discover hidden gems closer to home, perhaps? Uh, yes, that definitely is the case. Uh, being stuck in Australia in a way, I've kind of decided to do a series based around Sydney and just kind of see if I can create a body of work that feels a bit like Sydney through maybe 20 to 25 abstract images. And if it's there's still gonna be like this, but hopefully there's a bit of Sydney that can people can recognize. And do you want to tell us anything about the, some of the specific locations for this body of work then? Where 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 are we looking at uh, on the screen here? Uh, I guess you can probably you can go to the the pink one is the one I get the questions on the most. Yeah. Actually, yeah, because I had it at the fair and because everyone, when they see it in person, they don't believe it's pink and they ask if it's collaged and it's uh, if I was like changing the color or anything. But there's a pink building in Los Angeles and that's what this is a part of. And then the, the metal grate is part of their roof and the white is the divider line between the next shop front with the blue being the sky. So to capture this, I went across the street with a long lens and just shot it many a times to make sure that metal part lined up with the white. <laughs> and then this image also, I guess, shows how I just shoot also on no cloud day. So I get this flat blue effect and it creates another shape within the composition. Yeah. And any others you'd like to, to give us a little bit of an insight into the... Uh, uh... Yeah, well, I guess the pink and gray there, I guess that's pretty that down there. Yeah, yeah. That one uh, I had at the fair as well, but it's a very, very famous building. It's the Sydney Opera House, actually. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. taking on a completely different form. Yeah, yeah. It's, so the gray concrete is the side of the stairs, and with the pink wood being some construction office I had underneath the stairs one time when I shot it. So, I could have taken a lot of guesses, and I don't think I would have come up with Sydney. Nah, but again, it's like when you tell people that people then resonate, like they can see Sydney and they can have these memories and experiences come back to them, which is also what I want to, for people to have. Because maybe then then they can start looking for themselves. So. Yeah, and, and I think then it's great to say, oh, well, that's uh, actually a picture of the the Sydney Opera House and people are seeing it in a completely different context. And I'm sure, so 
where let's take any journeys else, elsewhere than outside of uh, the US and Australia we've got because you've also traveled across uh, Asia, New Zealand. Yeah, go back to the above the pink one that you had, that blue, the three blue one uh, to the left. Oh, yeah, not over here. That one, yeah. So that's, I think, the only one of this series that's in Asia. This was in Bali and it's three bill or it's two billboards and then the top part is the sky again. And so I just call it three kinds of blue because it's different shades of blue, but the two one, the two billboards are shots of the sky as well. And then I just line them up and then compose it within. Yeah. So it's like, it felt very Bali because it's like all this sun and sky and very beachy environment. So that's a lot. That's what I liked about it. It felt to me, it felt very Bali trying to advertise what they were selling. And you can you can totally see with this one how people can you know misconstrue the work that you're putting before them as you know something other than a photograph you know whether that's paint whether that's collage that's something that you have created but actually it's just uh, a celebration of the environment you're in um, yeah. it's in its real form uh, but seen through through a different lens. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, oh, thanks, Luke. Yeah. Really good to see your work, and I encourage everyone to check check it all out. Um, at John Stan. And again, if the people have specific questions, we're going to invite him back later. Uh, so we're now going to take on from these big pops of bold color, uh, courtesy of John Setter, we're going to go and visit Ian Thomas, who's got a slightly more pared back color palette. Um, so we're going to find Ian and say hello. Hello, Ian. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Very well indeed, thank you. Very well indeed. So, tell us a bit about this body of work. Um, when did it get started for you? Uh, oh, it, well, it started... Um, I, I'm normally like a big, splashy, abstract, messy painter. Uh, so this is kind of very different to what I would normally uh, exhibit, um, but it kind of, <laughs> very different, but it kind of, um, it began for me, I was lucky enough at the beginning in February of 2020 to uh, go to Paris for a month where I did a residency um, at a gallery called Factory 49, which has a kind of sister gallery here in Sydney. Um, and while I was there, I made an installation um, which I'd, I'd kind of taken materials with me. I knew that I kind of needed something that was kind of easily portable. And I took these huge rolls of um, rice paper and I ended up while I was there kind of cutting into them and cutting circles. And I, I love that idea of working with circles as kind of the perfect shape um, and just using that idea of the kind of continuum of a circle. Um, but I ended up making this installation, which was kind of these big uh, strips of rice paper, which were suspended across the ceiling in this gallery, but they all had kind of holes cut into them or whole or circles applied to them. Um, and it kind of, uh, it was an interesting experience. Like on the one hand, I had this amazing time in Paris when Paris was still open. Um, I mean, I got there just in time and had a, you know, a lot of fun. But at the same time, my mother passed away in England while I was there. And so this work kind of started to become about her and it was about this idea of kind of presence and absence and reflection and the kind of marks that you leave behind. And I tried to kind of represent that by creating spaces in the, in the rice paper strips or kind of uh, painting onto them or using reflective surfaces or even using the strips that where I kind of painted circles using the kind of underlayer which I'd used as a kind of floor covering that became part of the insulation as kind of that idea about something about the idea you know the the what you leave behind um so sorry this is a slightly long story but anyway I um well, happy to hear it. <laughs> uh, so I ended up yeah having this fantastic time in Paris went back to England for two weeks uh which was very different went to my mother's funeral got back here just as everything closed uh, and did my, you know, 14 days self-isolation and then suddenly we were in lockdown. And it just felt like all of that led me to this much kind of quieter place. And I just wanted to make some work which was quiet, I guess. Um, and so that's what these kind of series of drawings are. Um, they're 
basically they all started in the same way. I had a template for the kind of 15 circles, which I applied with uh, spray enamel and then worked into them in different ways. And I kind of like that idea that the more you uh, draw this perfect shape, especially if you're a bit messy like me, the more it kind of breaks down and becomes the imperfect shape. So there's also this weird metaphor of kind of the perfect becoming the imperfect, which felt very appropriate for last year. But I, the idea was that they were much more kind of meditative, meditative, quiet, uh, introspective pieces. And that's kind of what I ended up showing up there. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting because obviously going back to what Nicole said earlier in terms of having that kind of seismic and catastrophic event around her took yeah. her into being really loud and bold and, 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 and sort of going in one direction. And here we have something where it's, you know, you're maybe more introspective and, and, and insular and, and paired back, but um, yeah. both in response to difficult times. Um, so, so this is about legacy and this is about that lasting impression is the repetition um, of the, those, those motifs relevant in that, that context in terms of um, just the to an extent, I think it was more about just kind of almost uh, not thinking and almost kind of working automatically and kind of drawing around templates and repeating and just seeing how um, different materials worked on the paper. Um, so they kind of worked into with either charcoal or ink or um, oil bar or uh, Conte crayons or it, lots of different ways of using them. Um, and I also like that idea. I, th I mean, for me, like, I, I, I don't know, I live quite a busy life and I like to get out and see people and, you know, go to galleries and go to openings and every, it just felt like everything was so quiet. And in some ways I, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. It was kind of really nice to have this weird kind of excuse for being introverted and uh, <laughs> you know, not leaving the house and, you know, from time to time sitting and watching eight hours of Netflix and not feeling guilty about it. Um, and this, this kind of felt like some kind of reflection of, of that, that kind of strange time. But also some of them, those, I think maybe that black one in the top corner, which is um, enamel uh, spray. And then there's um, chalk kind of grated over the top of it and then um, some of it adheres to the paint and some of it doesn't but it felt like they kind of created this I don't know like almost like different worlds and uh, I kind of quite like that idea that you can almost dive through them and get to somewhere else dive through the black hole <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, George I think some of us definitely wanted to do at points last year um, I, I think it's a good demonstration where what whilst we've got this uh, you know this repeating motif across this this body of work, you know it's still showing how you experiment the fact that you do always kind of you're always doing different things and using different materials and um, you know just playing with with the form um, yeah create completely different effects each time and, and finding those things that that work. Yeah, um, and I mean, I also, I always think that that's, you know, for me, like the pleasure of, you know, being an artist is the pleasure of making and being productive and trying different things. And, you know, a day in the studio is a kind of like playtime for me. And, you know, I, I like that kind of playfulness of trying different things and just seeing what happens. And sometimes, you, you know, you get a lucky accident. Sometimes things don't work and you just screw it up and start again. But, um, I'm never too kind of precious about the way I work. I like to just try different things and just just see where they where they take me. Mm. Absolutely. Um, well, great. Well, that is. Thank you for showing us that. that Ian and talking us through it. Sure. So I'm going to invite everyone back on. We can see if we've got any questions. So I suppose I should ask each of you as well, what else you'll have in store coming up um, in, now that we've had, you know, you've had this body collection and body of work on show at both the in-person fair and now in the, um, the virtual editions, what, what we can expect from your, each of you next? Who wants to take that first? Ian, I know you've got some big plans next month. I think, yeah, I, uh, yeah I have, I've got a, a solo show coming up uh, on the 28th of April, which is going to be at M2 Gallery in uh, Surrey Hills. Um, 
which is actually going to be completely different. I think I'm, I'm ready to be a bit extroverted again. And um, a bit like Nicole, I've been playing a lot of glitter and sparkly stuff. Oh. Um, and this, this new show is actually weirdly also about, kind of about my mum, so I don't want to sound like a mum obsessive, but um, the, the kind of backstory to it is um, once a year, my mum used to kind of get dressed. We lived in a very boring suburban area of the kind of greater London. And once a year, my mum would like descend the stairs in this evening gown and go off to my dad's dinner and dance. And I always used to go, oh, she's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And so I kind of make this body of work, which is kind of about that idea of uh, glamour, I guess. And it's kind of a sort of abstract take on evening dresses and uh, shoes and handbags. And I'm like deconstructing glow mesh handbags and rebuilding those in war works. And, um, I don't know, it's kind of like that idea of, I, for me anyway, as kind of growing up as a, a queer little kid in the suburbs, the joy of playing in my mum's jewellery box and finally I kind of get to do that in this show. So there's like lots of sparkles and the quiet days are over. Well, that sounds like a really lovely homage to your mum. You're definitely allowed to be <laughs> upset about your own mother. That's, uh, there's, no, there's no shame in that. Yeah, that's um, fine. Cool. Well, we're looking forward to seeing that. What about what about you, Nicole? What point expecting you next? Uh, I actually have no plans at the moment <laughs> except to go and blow mesh like bags. Ian, I'm so <laughs> excited about that. <laughs> like, mesh, I'm just like it's next the most level. amazing material. It's like it forms I know. when you and if it you is. kind of take them apart, they become almost like. I just like they're almost like animal pelts. They kind of form these amazing. Yeah, it's like and it's like chain mail. So it's yeah. like this amazing armor, but like it's glitter. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful to work with. It's really I'll be heading to the op shops for some of that. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll take a week or two off and then get painting again. I think I um I've I've just started a new job and a new uni course, so I've got fingers in a few pies, all to do with creative business. So, um, yeah, I don't know. And actually, actually on, the, on, the glitter, on the glitter front, I think it's something we should have touched upon. What was the, uh, how did you get started with glitter? Wasn't there a backstory there? Oh, that was, that was um, I made a book week costume for my son and it was, um, <laughs> It, it was, he went as a cloud, a cumulonimbus cloud. So basically I got a, an umbrella and covered it with white fluff, but it had glitter rain coming down. And every time I walked past it, I was like, that stuff is so cool. And so I just started sticking it to everything. And now it's on everything. <laughs> and John, what can we expect from you next? Uh, I just moved into a new artist studio space. So hopefully settle into there wait for the weather to get better and continue yeah. working on my sydney based series and maybe if i can get it all sorted show up by the end of the, end of the year and this really puts uh, yeah this puts a damper on your work you really need those blue skies to to be uh putting on a show um so i hope for all our sakes that that isn't for very long so i'm difficult to people in in sydney right now with quite extreme weather so um it's uh yeah we hope to emerge from this stronger soon. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that was our, a selection of our artists from Room One. Um, do go and check them out. So that's John Setter, Nicole Law, and Ian Thomas. Um, their work is all available in, in Room One. You can connect through to Saatchi Art to make purchases. And uh, I hope to see you all very soon. And thank you very much. <laughs>